Breaking at this hour, TBI agents are at the Alabama home of a truck driver accused in a kidnapping. The bloody underwear of several women were found inside that driver's truck. Roy Nelsch, to me, uh, really embodies evil. I mean, this to me was a pure embodiment of evil. There is, to this date, only one woman who police know was able to escape Nelsch. I was to the point where I felt desperate. I'll get you out of this truck. That's what you got. I already know I'm probably going to die, so I'm, I'm not going to go down without a fight. Jeremy, it's important to note, no one outside of police has ever seen what you have uncovered. The story, when you read it or hear about it, sounds like a movie. So you may think you're the only survivor. I do, I, I believe that I am. To be honest with you, my, my initial thought was, I thought he was a serial killer. My car battery went dead, my phone was dead, everything was dead, and it's just like tons of traffic, you know, and you're just sitting there like a sitting duck. I ended up running out of gas um, at like exit 86, right past exit 86. Were you feeling desperate? Yeah, it was hot. It was May 22nd. It was really hot outside. Here you are, you're, you have no money, stranded on the side of the interstate, and this truck pulls up behind you. Do you remember what you thought when you first pulled up? Yeah, I thought, well, this looks like, like a friendly neighbor I might borrow a lawnmower from. He just kind of yelled from his truck, do you need help? And I said, yeah, he says, well, come on, get in, and I'll, I'll give you a ride to the next exit, get you some gas, and bring you back. I taught my kids the same, like, never talk to strangers, and I know better and all that, but again, you know, it, I didn't feel like I had any options at that point. I said, sure, thank you, yes, did not think that he was going to do what he did. I got into the truck. So at that point, you did not think he was a danger at all? No. How would you describe what he was like when you first met him? Very awkward, very, very awkward. Um, I, I got in the truck and he was driving and he asked me if I want to go on his route. And I said, oh, I, I can't do that. I said that I have small kids here that I need to be here for, you know, and I, I just, I felt like it was already an awkward question because he don't even know me. And, you know, I was like, okay, Abby, just get through this, go get gas, go back to your car and it's done. He said, well, maybe I'll just have to kidnap you. And I thought, wow, what a awkward joke to, to make. I know that you were watching for your exit. I said, why aren't you getting in the right lane? And he said, nobody will let me over. And I, I was just like, no, that's not true because I'm looking out the passenger side mirror and there's nobody on the interstate, barely anybody. And then it was silent, awkward silence. And then finally I said, thank you for your time. I don't need your help anymore. I appreciate it. Please pull over and let me out. He's pulling over and I think he's letting me out. So I grab my purse, I look up at him and I'm thinking I'm about to say thank you. And he has a gun pointed at me. He said, this is a kidnapping. I'm gonna rape you, get in the back of the truck. He was very laid back and I, like he'd done it before. I begged and pleaded with him at first. I said, please don't do this. I said, I've, I've got little kids who need me. So I thought, I need to comply. So I did what he said. I went to the back of the truck. But then when I got to the back of the truck, things in my head changed. I, I was like, nope, I'm not going down without a fight. Troy, my name's Dennis. I'm one of the detectives here. While it was happening, I was already working. He was taken into custody. He was brought back to our office. 
Well, I, uh, I spent some time with uh, Ms. Pimentel first and got her version of events. I did sit down that afternoon or early that evening with Mr. Nelsch. Your name is Roy, correct? I'm sorry? Your name is Roy, sir? Roy, right, yeah. I know there's a, a lot going on. Oh, lot yeah. <laughs> How serious is it? Well, and that's what I don't know. If you're willing to tell me what happened, I'm all ears. She looked like she was, you know, desperate needing help. I'll take you to get some gas. She said, pull over. What? There's nothing here. She gets back and said, I want to make a deal for you for some gas money. She said, give me your money. What? Give me your money, I'm gonna tell you to rape me. He said, give me your wallet or give me your money. Mr. Nelsch gave me a story that mirrored all the facts of Ms. Mentals. Different reason for him. He tried to make up some story about how he was citizen arresting me because I was trying to rob him. Uh, the question is, who's telling the truth? She was, she was showing some. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you give me your money, I'm gonna tell him you rape me. You're crazy, get out of my truck. She come on around. He started hitting me and beating me. He jumped on me and we're wrestling for this gun. She reached to grab my gun and then I was in a panic. He's on top of me and I have the gun pointed at his face now. I'm on the bottom, he's on the top. I tried to twist the gun out of her hand. I didn't want her to shoot her, didn't want her to shoot me. And I have the gun pointed at his face. I want you to stop. God. And I pulled the trigger and nothing happened. I can only imagine what you were thinking at this point. It was the worst feeling ever when you pull the trigger and nothing happens. Just thought, there, that, that was my one and only chance and it's gone. So when you pull the trigger, nothing happens, what does he do? He pulls a bigger gun out from somewhere. Yeah, I reached on her and got 40 and hit her in the head with it. He just banged me over, bashed me over the head with it really hard. And I mean, I remember feeling warm liquid pouring down my face and I didn't know at first what it was, but it was blood. I got her stopped and handcuffed. He put my hands behind my back and put handcuffs on me. And at that point, I remember thinking, okay, Abby, just comply with what he says, or pretend you're complying at least for right now, because he's going to get complacent at some point, and that's when you're going to make your move. I started cleaning up some I'm sorry, I hit you, you can't, don't beat on me. He lifted my dress up, you know, my hands were handcuffed behind my back. He said, do I need to gag you, or are you going to be quiet? And I said, I'll be quiet. First, he put a blanket over me, and I don't know why. He got back in the driver's seat and started driving. Did he say anything about where you were going? While he was wiping the blood away from my face, I asked him three questions. I said, are you going to kill me? He said, no, I'm just going to rape you. I said, how long are you going to keep me for? He said, a few days. I said, are you taking me somewhere scary? And that's the only thing that I could think of to ask because I kept thinking of those scary movies going through my head, you know, and he's gonna have me in some cage and with all these knives or something and torturing me or something. Like I kept thinking that way. And he said, um, no, you're gonna stay in the truck with me. I'm just taking you somewhere isolated. I, I'm thinking about the fact that my life is probably going to be over here soon. And then I would think about my kids and um, like every time I would think about my kids' names would go through my head and I'd just get this adrenaline, like this crazy amount of adrenaline go through my body and I'd be like thinking, you don't have the right to take away their mommy. First I had to get my hand out of this handcuff. Honestly, I didn't care if I ripped my whole arm off. Uh, I was not going with that guy. I was not gonna be raped by him. There's no way. So how did you do it? How'd you get your hand out? I ripped it out as hard as I could, as hard as I possibly could, and it hurt, but I didn't care. I take the blanket that he covered me up with, and I, I stood up, 
really tall and I just like I felt like a monster I was just like um, I was I felt savage like a like an animal I just took that the blanket and I lunged toward him as fast as I could and I threw the blanket over his head and I put my arm around his neck and I squeezed my muscles around his neck she's all over me beating on me kicking me and I grabbed the steering wheel with the other hand and I started swerving around, uh, swerving, like trying to tip the truck over. Where were you driving at that point? Yes! Did you put the blanket on you? Yes! You're trying to drive and hold him back at the same I'm trying time. To, I'm trying, not really trying to drive, I'm trying to tip over the semi. But I was, I was absolutely a crazy, savage animal, like fighting for my life. He ended up uh, saying, okay, okay, okay. Calm down. Let me get my one handcuff off you and I'll get you out of this truck. That's what you got. He stops the truck and, you know, put his foot on the brake and I said, you're going to let me out right now. And he, he managed to get that handcuff off. I don't know how he got the blanket off his head. I don't remember that part. Like, everything happened so fast. I remember I jumped out of the semi. I had um, one shoe on, one shoe off, the other shoes up in the semi, half a dress on because he ripped it. He said something to you as you were leaving. What did he say? He said, um, I never expected you to fight that much. I've never had anyone fight this much before. I was like, whoa, <laughs> he's done this before. Like, wow. I thought, who am I dealing with here? I got the one handcuff off her and just pushed her out the truck. She's going to run back down the road. Well, I know what's going to happen now. She's got blood on her face. She's running down the road. I've got problems now. I ran to the back of the truck and made sure I looked at it. I got three letters off of the back of the truck. He, he just drives away and I'm, I'm sitting there like, help me, help me, <laughs> like trying to get somebody to ha stop. And the guy does pull over finally, calls 911 and gives me his phone and I tell the police what happened. They have an ambulance come and I, t I told them this is the description of the truck. That's all I can tell you. Then of course came out the news about what else was in the cab. It was shocking, you know, to, to find out what was there. Ten four, we're still heading towards Springfield. He is possibly armed. I just haven't tried to stop him yet. I just wanted more backup units. Hey, man. Hey, keep your hands up for me. All right, turn around. Turn around. Right now, you're just being detained. I was crazy. Yeah, apparently she's crazy enough to get you in some trouble. Yeah, she got me in some serious trouble. Live with breaking news. We are uncovering more information by the minute about a truck driver charged with kidnapping. Tonight, what he did when he was arrested led a local police chief to suspect more trouble was ahead. He actually came out of the truck with his hands up already in the air, so I really wasn't, uh, wasn't nervous or scared because I think he already knew what was going on because he got out of the truck with his hands up. You're one of the few people that actually spoke with him. One of the few people that got to ask him questions on the record. Have you ever been arrested for anything before? No, that's the first time I ever had a same handcuffs. Understood. He came across very, almost humbled, respectful. God, I ain't never hit a woman before. It became actually more alarming to me that he was that calm, that comfortable, and always had the right answers. She looked like she was, you know, desperate needing help. He seemed very well rehearsed. God, I just tried to help somebody out. And quite honestly, yeah, if I could have got it up, I would have I started changing my perception of him. The real cake topper to me. Get her subdued. He was the fact that he was going to drive around and get her medical help out there because she was bleeding until he found an officer. Get the cops out there. That's not a normal thing to do. It became actually more alarming to me that he was that calm, that comfortable, and always had the right answers. I just gotta ask, why do you carry handcuffs? Why do I carry handcuffs? Because a lot of the states I go to, my pistol permit is no good in. If somebody comes up, I've got that one chance to go across, hit them with the face with them, and handcuff them, cut the hell out of you started dawning on me that this, a lot of this was already there in his head, the answers. Why didn't you call the police? I mean, after she's off the car. Because I know exactly where it was going to go. 
Why yeah. don't I just pick up the cell phone and call 911 and say, hey, listen, this just have. went down. I should have. I was... Once she got out, I knew where it was going to go. She's got blood on her face. She's running down the road. I've got problems now. I'm going to ask you uh, if you would give us consent to go through your vehicle. You can say no. You have every right to say no. And you can do it anyway. Well, no. It, what we'll do is we'll apply for a search warrant. Yeah, you'll get it. Uh, I got nothing to hide in there. At this point, uh, Every, everything inside of me, especially based on uh, what we've already seen and, and some of the statements he's made, has told me that this is by no means his first time, and probably worse. How often would you say you picked up girls before? I don't know, maybe once every two, three months. If they're, uh, they're broke down, I'll stop and give them a hand. I don't screw around with truck stop girls because they got things that they ain't discovered yet. This ain't my first rodeo with, with girls out there trying to make a little money. It was strange when you're sitting with a man like this to watch, uh, watch it unfold in front of your very eyes to see what, what, quite frankly, what a monster is coming out. You had said something to her that you've never had anybody fight you like this before. Does that sound familiar or was there a variant no. to that? Okay. I've never, I've never, I don't fight women, I don't hit women. I'm scared to death. Don't be, don't be. We're going to get the truth. One way or another, we will get the truth. I promise you that. Okay, this isn't something I do all the time, probably not more every couple of months, but I've got a, a friend who works over at the Secret Service building. He runs a polygraph. It's a, a lie detector for layman's terms. Is that something you'd be willing to do if I had Jeremy come down here tonight? You're not interested in right. polygraph for no one. I think you're dealing with a man that's been doing it for so many years, he's got a, uh, I, I hate to say Jekyll and Hyde, but almost a switch that can turn on this charisma and then turn it right back off when he's ready. I just wonder if you'd be okay with me taking a quick DNA swab. Uh, it's her blood in the truck. Her no doubt about that. Well, I know, but I, I, need, to, I need to be sure. Hey, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. That's good? Yes. Well, you got to buy my fingerprints in your system, no doubt. Oh, no, no worries about that. I'm just using it as an example. But now you got my DNA. First one to get it. By that point, we had all the evidence from the vehicle. There was a lot more to this, and uh, based on what I kind of took from him from the interview and the items we found in that vehicle, I'll be honest with you, my, my initial thought was I thought he was a serial killer. There's been a lot of things in your truck that have been collected that are very, very discomfortable. Questionable. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. And I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but yes. I just wanted to let you know that we are collecting that for the time yeah. being, okay? I don't know. When I gave permission to search the truck, I gave permission to get that, didn't I? The bloody underwear of several women were found inside that driver's truck. Some of the... Um, say tools that were in that vehicle were barbaric in nature. These are, are things that uh, to me suggest uh, a torture mindset. I really think this is not your first time with something like this. And I'm wondering, is there going to be any other cases that are going to come back on that? No. Not that I know of. There's a real problem with your version of events. I, I can understand it. I can understand it. It doesn't make sense. I can understand that. It doesn't make sense. It's potentially serious charges. It's been trouble. very serious trouble. I think all the things that have been collected, the evidence that's being put together is, is fairly strong. I don't think you're being completely truthful. I can understand why you would say that because I've been running back to my mind over and over and over. And I see a thousand mistakes I made, but I can't change a damn one of them. The biggest problem in that version was handcuffs. Yeah, probably are. They probably are. Nobody handcuffs somebody they're trying to get rid of. You handcuff to keep somebody. My thought has been that, yeah, there probably are victims out there. If I was sitting no, uh, in your shoes, I would be saying the same thing. I think I probably need to get a lawyer. Invoke your, your Fifth Amendment. Yeah. It's looking bad in my mind. I know it's looking bad in your mind. Roy Nelsch, to me, uh, really embodies evil. I mean, this to me was a pure embodiment of evil. 
And breaking news at this hour, the U.S. Attorney of Middle Tennessee telling News 4 investigates that a multi-state investigation is underway to find out if a truck driver has victims throughout the Mid-South. It comes as that truck driver, Roy Nelsh, appears before a federal judge tonight on new charges. Let's go live to Chief Investigator Jeremy Finley at the federal courthouse. Jeremy, they're calling this man a danger to society. That's right, Tracy. The U.S. attorney from Middle Tennessee tells me what they found inside the cab of his truck is the reason they hauled him here today to federal court from Clarksville in order to charge him with multiple crimes and, he says, to make sure that he no longer drives the interstates of the Mid-South. Also, prosecutors revealed new findings tonight, saying Nelsh kept weapons, more than 10,000 images of child pornography, and a ledger with the names of women and children inside the cab of his truck. To be honest, that was the piece of evidence that chilled me the most. Do we know if any of those people are missing people? I, I can say that it's something that the TBI continues to investigate. I think that the evidence suggests that there were other victims. I've tried sex abuse cases. I've tried child pornography cases. Some of the most disturbing evidence I've ever seen. The story, when you read it or hear about it, sounds like a movie. Her fight to live, the will that must have come from so deep inside of her. I knew that she was just completely on adrenaline in that moment and that something inside her just made her fight to live. The boat rope with blood on it, that was, ugh, like what on earth was he gonna do to me? That's another question that constantly goes through my head, you know, how was I gonna die that day? Do you sometimes think about who else has been in that cab with him? Absolutely, all the time, all the time. And I wonder, and I, like, it's just, there's not a day that goes by I don't wonder or think about that. Hello, this is a prepaid call from... Roy. Hello. Hello. I love you and I love the you girls too. love you. I love you too. Obviously, I've heard those those same calls that he made to, to his loved ones. This is your home, and I'm still your wife, and we're still your family, and it's just the stated fact. Hoping, hoping you kind of stick with me through this and wherever it goes. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't know where it's going to go, really. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm planning for the worst. Yeah. If it goes as bad as I think it is, then, you know, whatever you want to do, because I will not be coming back any time in the future. It certainly did sound like, yes, he knew he was never going home. Hey, Melissa. Hey. I know they're recording this. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I just want to know, I mean, who in the hell were you supposed to have kidnapped? Well, I can't really talk about it right now. <laughs> I know you're a good friend, but uh, you don't you don't really get 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 too involved in this because it's it's uh it's not good. I don't want I don't want to drag you into it. A hitchhiker picking up. It's actually a short story that that everything got turned around on, but you know it it's not going to go well for me. I know that. They're calling this heinous. That's what what the investigators are. Calling. I don't know what heinous what? is. Wicked and evil. Oh. I can say what you've done, very wicked and evil to uh, whoever. I have no idea. So I get very little information. I really don't sound like you at all. They're blowing a plum way out of proportion, way, way, way out of proportion, but I figured they would. Hello. Hi, Melissa. It's Jeremy. How are you? I'm fine. I want to make it very clear that now this is on the record. The first question I wanted to ask you, how it is you even came to know Roy Nelsh? I got out of truck driving for a while, and when I came back, I had to go out with the trainer when I got hurt on with the company, and Roy was my trainer. You rode with him for quite some time, right? The training program was uh, four to six weeks, so I stayed uh, 
with him on the truck for at least four weeks. Would you describe him as a friend? Yes, he was a very uh, close and dear friend. Roy, he, he liked chasing women, but he was faithful to uh, taking care of his family, making sure uh, everything at home was taken care of. Well, I've listened to your conversations that you had with him. You've made it very clear to him that you know what prosecutors and police have said. Were you trying to get answers as well? Did you have your doubts? I definitely had my doubts about what uh, they were accusing Roy of, what the woman was accusing Roy of. And they was basing that off of her statement in an affidavit. So you believed him? Roy never told me the full story because he was advised by his lawyer not to discuss any part of that case with anyone because it could be used against him. So what do you think about the question that there may be other victims out there? I don't believe that. Why don't you believe that? I never even seen Roy ever lose his temper. I've seen him get mad, but I've seen him stop and stop himself from going any further. So you never saw him get angry? You never saw him do anything violent? No, ever. There were a lot of things found in the cab of that truck that were really disturbing, uh, from women's underwear with, with blood on it, to a bloody rope, to a knife. I got rope, knife, duct tape, and all kinds of damn zip ties and on my truck. That's part of the equipment I need on my truck. Do you think that's what that those were, were was equipment? That's what I know it was, is equipment, because I've been in Roy's truck. Do you feel like that you actually knew him? Or do you think he could have been living a double life? Look, I knew that there was uh, times that Roy would stop and pick women up. He admitted that to me. But as far as uh, Roy being the type that uh, tried to force himself on women, being on the truck with him, no, he never tried any of that with me. Did he intend to go to trial? Did he want to go to trial? Yes, he intended to go to trial. His leukemia had progressed. They had diagnosed it in the, at the detention center. He didn't want any treatment. He didn't want to go through any treatment with uh, the leukemia. Did he keep this evidence? Did he keep these women's clothing as trophies? Unfortunately, we'll never know. The long-haul trucker accused of kidnapping a woman and keeping a bloody bag filled with women's underwear in the cab of his truck has died. When you found out that he had died, what was your first thought? I reached out to Abby. I wanted to make sure, but she already knew. I was upset. I didn't want him to die yet. I really didn't. I wanted to do the trial first, and I wanted, you know, I wanted him to be exposed. I wanted him to have to face the world um, for what for what he's done. I wanted to know more about what he's done. He is the key to what I believe is going to be a lot of unsolved cases, a lot of mysteries, possibly a lot of victims out there. So yeah, I feel that his passing may may leave a lot of questions unanswered. Tonight, what News 4 Investigates has uncovered is perhaps the most troubling secret about a long-haul truck driver suspected of being a serial killer of women. Now, we want to warn you, the details are extremely graphic. Chief Investigative Reporter Jeremy Finley then traveled to Coleman, Alabama to track down those who knew about him and the secrets he kept. Behind bars, Roy Nelsh's only communication was by phone. Calls to a woman who knew one of Nelsh's most troubling secrets. I was in a lonely state. Um, I had left an abusive relationship and I was just looking for it just to feel something. I love you. You know that, don't you? Yeah. You, do you really know that? I, I actually 
Bill. What enticed you at all to even begin a relationship with this guy? Companionship, I guess. I was just really lonely and he was nice. I wonder if you can talk about how you met him. I met him through a Craigslist ad. I was just looking for some kind of companionship and he had placed an ad. It was just something that when I read the ad that he had placed, I'm not quite sure why I answered it. I just thought, yeah, this sounds exciting, honestly. His ad was for a great fantasy. He was open from the very beginning. He was looking for some kind of rape fantasy. He was. We spoke on the phone, we spoke through text, and we set up going through with that fantasy that he had spoke about in the end. I have never done anything like this before. He came in with a mask on. He came in with a knife. Um, he cut my shirt off with the knife and he got me tied up really easily actually. I was surprised at how fast I was on the floor and he had my hands tied up. I immediately thought to myself, this is stupid, to, and I started trying to get the ropes off. I did manage to get one of the ropes off, but he saw me doing that and he tightened it. And that's when I kind of freaked out a little bit. And the fantasy stopped there because I told him, I do not like being tied up, I don't like this. And he untied me. You didn't have to fight him? Did not. Were you ever scared? Um, with the ropes on, I was, but immediately when he took them off when I asked him to, I wasn't afraid. So I thought that I was gonna enjoy this. I said, this is more, it's more real right now and I'm not liking this. He brought in a bag with him, and I later found out, it wasn't that night, but I later found out what he had in the bag. The things that he had in the bag were really quite disturbing. He never used them on me. I had no idea when I said I was up for anything what he actually had in mind. I think you told me that he called it something. Um, his bag of tricks. Can you tell me what was in it? Yeah, the thing that really got to me um, that I was shocked over was he had a thing full of pins and he had a stun gun and he said women would allow him to put the pins through their skin, whether it was on their chest, wherever, so that he would have these long pins. He, he would put them through their skin and he would use a stun gun on the pins, I guess to intensify the stun. Do you remember what you thought when you saw that? I thought that I was a complete idiot for even agreeing to do anything like this. Do you remember what else was in the bag? He had like a tire iron. I know he had some um, adult toys. He had rope, he had handcuffs. We discussed handcuffs and you said those are for, for use as a weapon. Yeah. Your handcuffs, you have a key available mm -hmm. because clearly you intend to put them on somebody at some point or potentially could. Well, I've had them on a barrel break. Understood. Well, that takes fixing to go to hell too. He wasn't talking about me. We never used handcuffs. That was not you? That was not me. Were warning bells going off in your head? No. He had made you feel pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. We got to the point of the pins and the stun gun. He was talking about different women that he had picked up and that um, actually enjoyed doing that. I had gone into his truck um, probably two different times, and he had his bag of tricks in there. He had um, women's bras hanging from one of the beds in there. And I asked him about his wife and what she thought about that, and he said that she, his wife had, doesn't ever go in the truck, she's not allowed to. Was there ever a time you thought, this guy is dangerous, this guy's bad news? Not until after he was arrested. How did you find out? He was supposed to come over, and it had been a couple days, I, I was trying to call him and he wasn't answering. And I said, let me Google his name. So I Googled him just thinking, I was thinking truck accident. And I googled his name and it came up that he had been arrested and I read the story about what had happened. What'd you think? I thought... Not that it wasn't surprising, it was surprising, but I pretty much immediately thought, yeah, this is something that he could do. So you weren't really that surprised, it sounds like. I wasn't really surprised when I read what he had done just because of how our relationship started. I knew what he was into. And he had talked about picking up girls? Yes. Do you think he was lying to you the whole time? I do. 
I really didn't think about it too much until uh, you contacted me. I do think he was lying. Definitely, I think he was lying. Do you worry that there are other women out there? I do. That is the only reason why I'm doing this. I feel like uh, just a complete fool, and it's super embarrassing for me. I'm shocked at my behavior, is looking back on it. And after going through therapy, I'm shocked at my behavior. When did you decide, we're done, I'm closing the store? My best recollection is um, after I heard what they found in this truck. I was, then I was mortified because children were involved. It's impossible to get past. Mm -hmm. You can't get past that. Mm -hmm. Then TBI agents reached out to you. Well, I reached out to them first. There was some kind of hotline number. If you know anything about this man to go ahead and call. And I just figured I, I'm going to go ahead and call and just kind of let them know what I know of him. I didn't want them to think that I was, I was hiding. Did they have serious suspicion that there were other victims? Yes. What were you going through after this happened? Well, I felt obviously horrible for the victim, horrible for his wife and his family. It was just a lot of shame and therapy. I wonder at the end of the day, do you feel like he was leading a double life? I definitely do. I definitely do. After this happened, what happened to your life? What happened to you? You were intending to move to Florida to be with your daughters. Yes. But that didn't happen. No, um, I just got stuck uh, where I was, just stuck in place. Um, I, I couldn't move forward. I, I don't know why. It was just really hard um, to even like think about the future and think about anything. And I would just day after day would pass and. I'd stay stuck. Eventually I did, you know, a couple of years later, um, pull it together and, and move. What do you think is the effect on you? My life was there and almost gone, like it, in this matter of seconds. I do have nightmares about it. Yeah, there are triggers that like, you know, um, remind me of, of, you know, have me, I end up having flashbacks. I don't know how I'm still alive. You wanted to know if there were other victims. Mm -hmm. You wanted to know all of this. There's a chance you may never know. We may never know what he did. It'll be a question mark in my head forever. I think that the evidence suggests that there were other victims. I hope if any of them see this production, that they can stop looking around the corner.